Thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. I guess we can go on to the, the first slide. So what I'll do today is uh, give you a little bit of background on the Kirtland warbler, <laughs> which is a small six inch bird you can see right there, top of the slide. That's a male, kind of bright lemon yellow underneath with black streaks along the side and kind of a grayish blue back with a, a white broken eye ring you can see there. And uh, so I'll give you a little bit about the biology of it and then we'll talk about some of the conservation work that's gone on with the Kirtland's warbler and what's anticipated down the road. So uh, next slide. The Kirtland's warbler is uh, perhaps the rarest North American migratory songbird in all of North America. Uh, there are only about uh, 2,100 singing males in the whole world. And uh, so about 4,200 males, assuming they're all paired. And then if you had a few young at the end of the year, might get up to five or 6,000. And that would be the, the peak number. Whereas most songbirds are in the neighborhood of hundreds of thousands to millions in contrast to the Kirtland Torbler. It is an extreme habitat specialist, a COC. It only grows in jack pine forests of a certain height and area. And also it's considered conservation reliant. By that, it means that it requires our work to keep the bird alive and well. And if we stop managing for Kirtland Warbler, it would likely go extinct. So you have to keep on top of it. And then it also it's very intensively studied so that's a good thing because that means we know a fair bit about the bird so we know how to manage for the bird and try to prevent the bird from becoming extinct. Um, and the other thing I'll just say right here is that while well, it, it has a very limited range, about more than 95% of all the birds occur in the northern lower peninsula here in Michigan, a few in Wisconsin, a few in Ontario, but that's most of them are around the Grayling, Mile, Rest Common areas. And similarly, it has a very limited winter range occurring only in the Bahamas in the winter, a few scattered records elsewhere, but almost all of them in the Bahamas. Okay, next slide. The word for the Kirtland Warbler though, and that's what KW means is Kirtland Warbler, has been very, very successful. It's taken a lot of people to manage the bird. And as you can see from the, the figure right there, you can't see the dates very well, but the first one is 1951. And then on the vertical axis, you can, the population, it was less than 500 singing males at that point. It almost went extinct. It got as low as about 170 singing males, so roughly 340 birds. So at that point, they would all fit in a bushel basket. These birds weighed less than an ounce. And then you can see that numbers went way up, uh, relatively speaking. So uh, by 2015, which is the last year on this graph, the numbers were uh, over 2,100 singing males. So it's been a great success story in bringing them back to extinction. And that, that horizontal line is the recovery goal. So when the bird was listed in 1972 as an endangered species, that was the goal at which it could be delisted. When it, once you reach 1,000 singing males four or five consecutive years. So that was done, and the result is that it was delisted in October of 2019. Okay, next slide. On the breeding grounds, it requires really intensive forest management to keep the bird alive and well. And those areas you see shaded in really dark black and gray represent areas that are managed specifically for Kirtland's warblers. In total, it's about 220,000 acres. The areas shown in gray are managed by the Forest Service, and the areas in black by Michigan Department of Natural Resources. <clears throat> so what you see right there on that map is where virtually all the birds occur. There are a few elsewhere, but not many. And in the upper right, you can see a figure or a picture of the habitat that they like in the breeding season. Real scrubby, thick jack pines, really tough to get through, and there you'll hear them singing. And in some of those areas, it's the most common bird. 
And then in the lower right, that's an aerial image that shows how the trees are planted. You can see there are lots of lighter tones inside that photo. And those are openings. The birds like to nest around openings. So they plant the trees in that pattern to maximize the edge or the area next to openings so the birds can nest in maximum numbers. So next slide. Now one of the major threats to Kirtland's warbler has been is a, what's called a nest parasite, the brown-headed cowbird. The brown-headed cowbird doesn't raise its young at all. It may lays its eggs in the nests of other birds, and then those birds raise the cowbirds. And the cowbirds hatch typically before the young of the host, and also they grow faster, and they have bigger mouths. So for some reason, the Kirtland warblers don't distinguish between the cowbird and their own young. They feed the cowbird with a bigger mouth and raise cowbirds instead of Kirtland warblers. So that was a real problem. So what they, what they ended up doing once that was determined was to build those cages you see in the lower right. And so they put in cowbird decoys and they put in some grain and to attract the cowbirds. And then they pulled in the cowbirds in the Kirtland warbler areas. Therefore, they didn't parasitize and lay their eggs in the nests of Kirtland warblers. And that virtually eliminated that problem. Yeah. So in the last two or three years, they haven't even had to trap cowbirds. So it's been an unexpected result that they could just eliminate the cowbirds from the area. And so that's made it a lot easier and it saves hundred thousand dollars a year which was the cost to needed to remove cowbirds from Kirtland Warbler areas so it's been a, a good thing okay next another thing it's important to have local communities support efforts of Kirtland Warbler management a lot of people don't like to see a lot of forest just cut and then replanted which is what you have to do with birds these Kirtland Warblers so they have programs and guided tours for that people can sign up for. And as you can see in the upper left, I mean, people come from all around the world to see Kirtland Warblers. They come from Europe and Asia, a lot of the states here. And these tours are pretty much a guarantee to see these birds. So it's, it's really been very useful. They also have a Kirtland Warbler Festival that's held up in the Roscommon area. They have all kinds of presentations on Kirtland warblers and tours to go to see the birds and all kinds of other things. So a little bit of input into the local economy, but also makes raises the awareness for the bird. Okay, next. But Kirtland warbler conservation is complicated because they, while well, they breed here in Michigan, they winter in the Bahamas. And in the this figure, this shows the migration routes of Kirtland's warblers. So I'll just walk on over to the slide and trace it out and hope you can hear me okay. If not, just let me know, raise your hand and I'll come on back, but I'll show you the route. So what they, they put on, what they call geolocators, and that sends off a signal that's detected once they can retrap the bird that describes the route of the bird. So here's a Kirtland warbler in this solid blue line right here that migrated from the Bahamas and then up through Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and on up to the breeding grounds here in Michigan. So in the spring, they cut a lot of birds more or less follow that route through Florida and on up. In the fall migration, which is shown by this dotted line, they like starting from Michigan and they migrate and have a more easterly migration route down through the Carolinas and then they fly over the Atlantic to the Bahamas where they spend the winter. And that can take as little as eight days to, for this bird that weighs less than an ounce to travel 1,500 miles. So it's pretty remarkable what they can do. And then this next figure over here that show with the yellow and the magenta, that shows where the birds concentrate during migration, where they've had the most number of readings during migration. So that a lot of birds end up in Florida, for example, or southern Georgia, and then come on up to the coast. So then on the far right, those are some 
bird watchers in northern Ohio on Lake Erie at the biggest week of American birding. And that's a good spot sometimes to see Kirtland Ward where every once in a while will show up and these mobs of people like that will show up to look for the bird. Okay, next. So when they go down to the Bahamas, they're not equally distributed throughout the Bahamas. There are about 700 islands and keys in the Bahamas. And those islands you see highlighted there, Eleuthera, Cat Island, San Salvador, and Long Island, seem to be the, where most of the birds show up. So when we look at where we do our conservation work in the Bahamas, we're focusing on those four islands. And then just for context, you can see Florida up in the very corner of the slide and Cuba down to the south. Next. And in the um, winter, they occur in this really thick, spiny scrub. So while I've been going down to the Bahamas every winter since 2002, and everybody kind of thinks you're on the beach and drinking margaritas and things. And in fact, we're going through this really thick scrub with all kinds of mosquitoes and things like that. So um, the birds have figured out how to find food there. And uh, we've gotten to be pretty good at predicting where the birds are with this, with this thick scrub. And also on the far right, you see two slides of, of small berries. In the top slide with the dark purple, that's called black torch. And then the one in the bottom, sort of the magenta, is called white sage. The birds really like to eat those fruits. So once we find this really thick scrub and we find those shrubs with fruit, especially in late winter, could be that's our cue, and that's probably good habitat to work with landowners to try to protect it or manage for it and help protect that habitat. Okay, next. And there are a lot of ways we can create winter habitats, some of which are kind of unusual for conservation. One is hurricanes, especially along the coast. So that's kind of a natural thing that goes, takes place in the Bahamas. And the salt spray kills taller trees and the wind. And so you got a, a zone of really thick scrub along the coastline in the Bahamas. And you get black torch and white sage in there sometimes. And you'll sometimes find birds there. Another is, in the, it gets really dry in March and April, especially in the Bahamas, and sometimes fires go through, and they too knock away the taller vegetation, so the shrubs come back up again, and that's good for Kirtland's warblers. And then other activities uh, that are just part of our culture, like rights of ways in the middle of the slide, is that they constantly clear that in order to keep the trees from taking down the power lines and the birds will just go and move along those power lines. So just by working with the local Bahamas Electricity Corporation and ensuring that they allow those shrubs to persist and not use herbicides, that's a, a no-cost conservation method that we can create habitat. In the upper right, you see a lot of goats. Normally, goats are considered a really anathema to conservation, especially on islands. But here, the goats are in pastures and fenced. So when they do that, they keep the vegetation down, and we also find a lot of black torch and white sage in goat pastures. So we're now actively working with people in the Bahamas to promote goat farming at a local scale as a way to create habitat, as well then as to create local economic incentive for people there on the, on the outlying islands in the Bahamas, where it's a pretty tough place to make a living. And then in the very far right, that's just sort of slash and burn agriculture, and then it is also taking out the taller vegetation, and the young stuff comes up with the black torch and the white sage. So a number of ways that can be created, both natural and through our own activities. Next. A really important part of what we've done is to increase the ability of Bahamians local Bahamas students to undertake conservation. So early on in the game, before we started this project in the late 1990s, we talked with Bahamians and asked what they wanted. And they said they wanted to educate students. So what we did is we brought in students to our project. And every winter, we bring in a couple of students. They would work with us for two winters. We'd have sort of an internship so they'd get paid. 
and we get we got funding to bring them up to Michigan so they could see the birds on the breeding grounds. And after they completed that, we also raised money so that they could finish their undergraduate education. So that group of students you see up there are all students that went through the whole program. And they, the idea is that they would then go back to the Bahamas and practice conservation there. So it's worked out pretty well. The young lady you see at the far left, Nigeria, is now working with the forest unit of the government of the Bahamas. And uh, the, the taller guy to the right there, Zico McKenzie, is now working on his PhD in California and, and working on Caribbean pine ecosystems. And then the short guy in yellow there, Scott Johnson, who worked for the Bahamas National Trust, an NGO that is conservation based and runs the national parks in the Bahamas. And then the other gentleman off to the right uh, worked with the Nature Conservancy for a while and now sort of a freelancer working on a variety of environmental projects. And then on the far right, um, Keith Philippe works for uh, the BEST Commission, which evaluates large projects from an ecological perspective in the Bahamas. So we've been pretty pleased that the students have come back and starting to take leadership roles in the country that includes Kirtland Twardlers. Okay, next. There are still a lot of threats in the Bahamas. So those are the three major ones, habitat loss, climate change, invasive species, and lack of capacity. So in the upper right hand slide there, you see the island of New Providence where Nassau is located. Maybe some of you have been there. And all that area shown in gray or the lighter color is the part that's been urbanized. So virtually all the land on New Providence has been overtaken by development. So we're really looking to those other islands we talked about, Luthra, Cats, and Salvador, and Long Island is where we do our work. But that is a, an ongoing threat. Climate change is a, just kind of a, could be particularly insidious for the Bahamas because of rising sea level. And the highest point in the Bahamas is only 200 feet above sea level. Most of it is below 20 feet. And so that not only it will result in a loss of land, but also it's going to contaminate the freshwater lens, which will have a negative effect on the vegetation used by Kirtland Twardler. But perhaps the worst threat of all is that the winters are supposed to get drier. As they get drier, there's less food for the birds, and then they migrate less successfully back. So it, it could result in higher uh, mortality of Kirtland Twardlers on the winter range. And then lack of capacity and funding is always an issue that any conservation program contends with. So we're trying to build up a, an endowment fund, a long-term fund over time to try to get us over the rough spots. Okay, next. So to resolve those threats, we have a couple of ways to do that. One is we've got a critical towards our conservation team uh, that replaced the recovery team when the species was in danger. And this conservation team in turn is broken up into three groups. One focuses on the breeding grounds, another on the non-breeding grounds, that is in the Bahamas and along the migration route. And then the other is human dimensions, basically socioeconomic issues that uh, could influence outcomes from conservation programs. And then we have another group, American Bird Conservancy, that I work with now, and we're trying to build this long-term fund. The Colonel Twardler Alliance, which is working really closely to help DNR with developing a census and other activities uh, deemed important by the conservation team, and, but primarily is focusing on, on fundraising and trying to support the whole range of activities that are needed for the Colonel Twardler. Okay, next. So I'll just give you an idea of what some of their projects are during the breeding grounds. It's to expand the curtain toward the range. If something happened around Grayling, Mile, West Common, and that Jack Pine Forest was going downhill fast, we need to have populations elsewhere to buffer should that happen. So there's an effort to increase habitat in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, Wisconsin, and also in Ontario, where a few birds breed. Also trying to adopt new forestry practices. Jack pine has very little value. And if that happens, then you can't send out contracts to have the forest cut so you regenerate new habitat. So now they're trying to intersperse planting of red pine, for example, which has a lot more value, and maybe that can help sustain the program. And the other is cowbird monitoring. As I mentioned, the cowbirds right now are 
not a big issue, but we need to continue to monitor that to make sure that's the case. So those are the really important priority activities on the breeding grounds right now. Okay, next. And the non-breeding grounds are focusing mostly on the wintry grounds because we don't quite know enough on migration to know what to do along the migration route. So we're trying to increase conservation capacity. So just even yesterday, I was in email contact with Bahamian colleagues to try to keep things moving. And it takes a lot of interaction with our Bahamian colleagues to do that. We're also hoping to map winter habitat so we have some idea if the habitat might restrict the number of birds that can colonize the Bahamas and stay there during the winter. We also want to work with the Bahamas Electricity Corporation, which is pretty simple. We just talk with some of their offices on those four main islands and say, you know, just please don't use herbicides. And so far that's been the case. They've been interested in just using bulldozers to keep it, which is good for us too. We're really working on the goat farming, so we've got uh, some experimental work taking place on the goat farming and doing some monitoring of Kirtland warblers and the occurrence of the white sage and the black torch on these new goat pastures. And we're working with local goat farmers and in, uh, on the island of Alufra to do that. So um, hopefully that'll all work out. And then with migration, there's still got to wait for some, we need smaller uh, transmitters before we can really pin down where most of the birds are concentrating and how they do at each stop over site. But everyone's looking to jump on that as soon as that technique and those methods are available. Okay, next slide. So the human dimensions, uh, the socioeconomic aspect of conservation, we're really trying to work with the stakeholders, all those that might be affected by Kirtland's warbler management and that uh, we can engage others like hotel owners and uh, people who own restaurants and others that benefit from increased tourism when people come to see the bird. And also trying to get more people involved, say there's a, a volunteer jack pine planting day and that sort of thing. So we can, again, generate more interest. And we'll have tours with members of chambers of commerce and legislators so that there's continued interest. Okay, next. And working in the Bahamas does offer special challenges. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the disastrous effects of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. A lot of my colleagues in the Bahamas lost everything. Their homes were swept away. Uh, another person I knew who was a retired P uh, doctor MD from Florida lost his whole house. He had a library of very rare bird books that was simply washed out to sea. And with climate change, that the frequency and severity of hurricanes is projected to increase. So all the disaster we had with that one hurricane that hit the two northernmost islands, Abaco and, and Grand Bahama, uh, we, so we just have to have the birds scattered around the Bahamas. So uh, you, it's pretty unusual that a hurricane affects all the Bahamian islands at one time. So we hope we can, the birds are dispersed widely enough that there's always one island that will be safe uh, with any given hurricane. But you can't control that very well. The best we can do is uh, have our own internal policies and EU and China and other countries just start, start to reduce emissions. And uh, that's about, at that scale, that's about what you can do. Okay, next. So also keep in mind that this work is, is of course, not just what I do, but it's a team of people and several countries uh, working collaboratively to make things happen. And in particular, the Forest Service, the Michigan uh, Department of Natural Resources manage a lot of critical habitat uh, for Kirtland's warblers. And the international program of the Forest Service has also been very instrumental in ensuring that our work in the Bahamas continues and helping, helping that along. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is saying they also provide resources to bring Bahamians up here to attend meetings, so we increase the extent of collaboration, and increasingly now the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as well. And the uh, bunch of organizations internationally shown in yellow that may not jump out quite as well, but we work with our Canadian colleagues, Environment Canada. We work with the Department of, of Defense, 
in Canada as well. Some of the military bases have fairly large numbers of curtain twirlers, uh, working with behavior organizations like the Bahamas National Trust, University of the Bahamas, and also very importantly, individual landowners who allow us access to their land to study the bird. And then we have important funders like various foundations. Uh, the Harry A. and Margaret D. Towson Foundation has been really instrumental in, in getting our program started, American Bird Conservancy, other foundations, Huron Pines, Michigan Audubon Society, all are chipping in to make this happen. Okay, next slide. So just uh, some that have been especially important to make this happen. So the, the Harry A. Margaret D. Towson Foundation contributed $500,000 over three years for us to get things started, um, which has been really great and appreciated. We've also had some very talented project managers in the Bahamas. Uh, we couldn't do the work ourselves, so we've had people year-round positions to help run the program in the Bahamas. And so we recruited Dave Curry from Scotland to join us, uh, Jennifer White from Minnesota, and Jean Fleming, who's now in Australia. So we've had an interesting and a very talented group of people to run the project down there. And then uh, they, our Bahamian colleagues, like Eric Carey, he's the executive director of Bahamas National Trust. Without his support, we would, couldn't have done work in the country. He opens all kinds of doors to other Bahamians to make things happen. And same thing with Eleanor Phillips, the Nature Conservancy, and then especially the students. They've been a, an amazing group of kids. Uh, we didn't live under very fancy conditions. It was a very simple house in a place, metropolis of Tarquin Bay with all the 200 people. And uh, we had cockroaches and huge centipedes and millipedes that would come out of the drains. Occasionally a rat would come in. So. We were, we were uh, chickens were all around the yard from the neighbors and dogs barking all night and stuff like that. So cause it wasn't exactly the Ritz where we were staying, but uh, students were very tolerant and got up at 4.30 every morning to do mist netting and looking for birds. And uh, they really stuck with us. So it's greatly appreciated what they did. The next slide. So now what we're really trying to do is build an endowment fund for the Kirtland Warbler. Uh, because funding from grants and other sources is not always predictable. So we're trying to do that right now. And um, we've had donor trips to the Bahamas and here and, and working with people to uh, try to generate and appreciate uh, an effort like this. And we hope this will be a model for, model for conservation of other species because any species that's going to depend upon our efforts indefinitely it's going to run into the same problems as critical toward So if we can show success, maybe that will um, empower others to do the same thing with other species, birds and otherwise. OK, next. So uh, hopefully I'll give you a brief overview of what we're doing with critical toward And if you have any questions or comments, uh, this is a, a good time to do it. OK, actually, three questions. <laughs> Um, I think you implied that it's just the males that sing. Is that right? Yeah. It's, it's, well, there was one report of potential females singing this year, but that's the only report we know of. Uh, yes, males. And the other was, uh, isn't it true that uh, for a while the Kirkland Warbler was a state bird of Michigan? There was an effort to make it the state bird of Michigan, but it, it didn't succeed. Okay, okay. I remember. Okay, and the last is about the counting of the, uh, the population, you know, maybe you could say more about the, how you do that, put the tr transmitters on them. How reliable is that counting? How do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's under active review. What's been done in the past is run parallel transects across all known jack pine stands at the right age in Michigan and now Wisconsin. <coughs> So you just have a group of observers, and they walk slowly through, and they stop every 600 feet, and they listen for five minutes, and they count all the curtain warblers at each one of those stations, and then they tally up the number at the end. So um, there is error associated with that. So now what they're trying to do is do something, a couple of other techniques, but one that maybe will have some promise is what's called a point count 
where it's a standardized approach where you just stand at one location for five to ten minutes and then you record birds at different intervals and then from that you try to estimate how readily you can find a bird and that is just being done simultaneously with the older technique of just running the transects and from that we can get more statistical inference on the accuracy of the count. Right now we just come up with a total. It's probably pretty darn close to the number of birds, but this will make it a little bit more precise. And you say you have transmitters on some of them that helps uh, check the uh, migration, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's a little bit different than the counting. That's just, uh, these are, are uh, just small little chips that are put on a harness on the bird, and that doesn't affect the bird. And then you have to recapture the bird, and then you download the data from that chip, and then from that, it, you can get latitude and longitude at the frequency at which the chip is programmed. And so that way you can get the migration route. Hopefully there'll be other techniques. Real time is really what we want, because uh, it turns out most mortality of birds, for adult birds, is during migration. But we don't know where in migration that's occurring. So there's some other techniques that are being tried, but the best is real-time satellite transmitters. But the, uh, <clears throat> the batteries are so large that you can't put them on a small bird like this yet. But I'm sure that they will be miniaturized and they're getting better every year. So at some point we'll get that. Yeah. I've been a member of Nature Conservation. 